Bollywood to Hollywood with Rao Rampilla. This may look strange to you. Never in a show, a interviewer or a host becomes an interviewee. So I, I'm going to become an interviewee, and Arthur French is going to interview me because he was my teacher. Well, here I go uh, from Bollywood to Harlem to Hollywood <laughs> back again. <laughs> I was talking with you before the show started, uh -huh. and as I was talking to Rao, as I call him, uh, he started telling me about himself, and I thought he was so fascinating. I said, well, I would like to know more about you. So your whereabouts were you born, Rao? Well, uh, I was born in Deep South, which is mm -hmm. uh, Deep South of India, uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, by the Krishna River. It's close to Madras. So. Good. And well, how did you become interested in theater? Did you do it as a boy, as a child? It's, it's funny you ask me, because uh, when we were children, uh, we celebrate this festival in India, Dasra, Dasra, and people paint themselves like monkeys and lions and all that. They come dancing in the uh, streets, go house to house. And I wanted to do that. Yeah. And my father uh, refused to let me do that. So when I was in college, almost finishing the college, uh, secretly we went to learn some music. We went to play guitar. So we went to a school there, music school. And the teacher only taught us classical Indian music. At the end of the year, uh, we did a play. Ah. So it's uh, it's called watering, watering, watering it. So it's a poet. I played the role of a poet, uh, watering the plant. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, what did you do? What since you did did you act after that or? Uh, no, I was. Uh, well, before that, I used to write poetry. Oh. Uh, and uh, and uh, it was an all India radio. Uh, then uh, I used to run a newspaper, so I used to sit down before the kerosene lamp in the midnight. We didn't have electricity at that time, so, and I used to write it, the poem. Uh, and one time, my mother, my stepmother, she was grinding the uh, rice in a grinder. So I thought people are being all the rice. Um, was like right. uh, people, mm -hmm. and I felt like they were being grinded. Oh, so. Uh, so I wrote a poem about it, and I published it. Next day, somebody threw a knife from the other side to kill me. So to to say that it is effective. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you remember a small, a short poem that you had written? That you yeah. One time uh, we used to have a poet, poet by name Sri Sri. He was a radical poet. I used to uh, copy his style. So I wrote a poem. Um, I, I heard his uh, poem poem about love in a movie, and it moved me so much. So I went and wrote another poem. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> it was Manisiloni Manasuni, Manasuloni Mamatani, Anuvanuvu Kadilinchi, Manasulanu Palikinchi, Rasamaduri Muntech, Muncheti, Badalani Marapinchi, Sangani Murkininchi, Gantanto, Pekilinchi, Kalalukana Prapanchani, Swadda Parula Chartanundi, Velikiti, Sieti Chupi Rachabat and Adipede, Navayugapu, Navakavita, Bavitavia Pubava Kavita. What it means is uh, uh, the, the a poem is a, the poem that uh, pulls people out of the gutter and cleans them with their heart's blood and uh, lifts them up high and shows the new path to the world is the uh, new poetry and progressive poetry and that is the real poem. So I find out, define the poem through a, through a poem. Uh, that's beautiful. Uh, Thank you. And it also has a point of view to it. Yes. Well, after college, what did you do after college? Well, I went to uh, I went to three law schools. Three, uh, I, I think, say four law schools. Oh my! Uh, so I got three law degrees. I l missed one. I went to National University, where I was involved with the uh, Untouchables. I was on hunger strike for 14 days, so I became popular in the country. 
and the other the flip side is I eventually have to they kicked me out of the school so I left the country I came to America you weren't popular with everybody obviously well not with everyone <laughs> I have a lot of uh, antagonists yeah. but that's good that's good that you took a stand for something you believed in yeah I had some friends who politicized me but there was something inside I me mean. these are people I used to play uh, marbles at the, when I was a kid and and being discriminated uh, uh, between those people who played marbles with me and me would be bad. You don't want to separate them. It's like the blacks and the whites. Right. But uh, let me ask you that. I was just going to ask you that because here it's clear who somebody's black or somebody's white. But what's the difference there? Is it a color difference or no, a religious not, difference? Or? Not very much. We all came from the same right. religion. So what what would make what would be the uh, the difference the well, it Racism was way there. back in 500 B.C. And uh, uh, Manu and others created this system of caste. And so few people put themselves up as higher and the rest of them lower. So these people who are now 300 million people uh, are subjugated. And you can't change it. Here, you can, if you have money, you can change your class. <laughs> but in India, if you, even if you have money, you, you can't change it. Once you are born into that caste, you die into that caste. Yes, that's it. That's why India couldn't become a superpower. That's why there was no revolution in India, unlike neighboring China or Russia. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Well, tell now that you're in America, you've left India, what, what do you do here? What, how did you connect here? Well, I, 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 st I came to school and I studied with the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk. He was my professor. Uh, so I wanted to be an international lawyer. So my dream was, uh, I took a challenge when I was in college. One of my relatives from whom my father uh, borrowed some money, uh, one time she uh, asked me in the street, so are you going to become a Sunday lawyer? He heard I'm going to the law, sc uh, mm -hmm. law school. So I said, no, 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 I want to become an international lawyer. Uh. And I told him I'll be on the 34th floor of the United Nations. And were you? And, uh, yeah, it took me 20 years, so I eventually were at the 34th floor of the United Nations. That's so I fulfilled my challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful that you seem to have achieved goals that you've set for yourself, even over a long period of time, 20 years. So I'd like to ask you, what are your goals now? Well, you know, it's funny. As a child, I learned, because I lost my mother, so I was introduced to the library. Uh, and there, I used to read all the life histories of the people, including Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, everyone. I realized in my early ages, there is nothing impossible. And uh, all I have to do is I have to believe strongly. If I believe in something strongly, it will happen. And it happened with this international lawyer thing. And then, it's uh, after, for you to answer your question straight, after 9-11, accidentally, I was put into a Super Bowl commercial with Kevin Bacon. Uh, and I didn't know what is a commercial, Super Bowl commercial, what is a uh, audition, what, it just happened accidentally, and I was broke. And I realized all my life, I was going against the stream for the first time, something fell into my lap. And I thought, well, I take, like the Americans say, I take the ball and run and Good. see where it takes me. And then more I'm running with it, this, with the acting, and I'm finding more things. Uh, some are painful, some are not so lucrative, but I started writing my play. Yes, sir. I, the issue that was uh, because they wouldn't put me in major movies because of my accent. So I said, okay, now I have to take charge. Uh -huh. So uh, I have to do, uh, produce things. So in order to produce, I need to write. So and what do I want to write? I thought, what is the biggest issue, or the most, uh, uh, most important issue I think it is? So in my life about this struggle I went through, 
So I thought that's what I want to write. So I wrote about it. That's the play I yes. brought to the class. I wrote very well about it. Very oh, thank moving. you. And now it is going to be read in a, a medicine so theater on 52nd Street. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Uh, so in that uh, writing class I learned, well, the teacher says there are 84 keys in piano. So if I have 84 keys in my life, <laughs> if I'm only one, playing only one key of lawyer, so I'm not fully utilizing or enjoying my life or, or playing all my piano. Okay. So I'm playing the second key now, the acting, <laughs> a third key writing, and a fourth key producing. And also found I could do things which I couldn't do as a lawyer, lawyer as a civil servant. Such you, as? Well, you can involve in certain advocate politically if you are working for international civil service at the United Nations. Uh -huh. So now I can bring some of these issues, put it on the stage or put it on the screen uh, and uh, show it to the people. So I have the other side now bring, coming back. But you still it's still part of what you did as a young person, yes. your poetry and everything else. I just have one thing to say. There are 88 keys on both of them. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I, guess, I, guess, I guess that's what makes the difference between a teacher and a student, right? <laughs> I just want you to play all the keys yeah, as so you've I been have, doing. Have, uh, what would you like to as an actor now? And you've been studying speech and you've been reading lots of plays, you told me. What, what, is there a special part, role, or there's a special playwright that speaks to you? You know, it's funny you ask me that question. I mean, everyone wants to be on either Bollywood or Hollywood, but yeah. sometimes Hollywood doesn't uh, inspire me mm -hmm. as much as it should, because I still would like to work there. Um, when Ashton, I was in Ashton Pendleton's class for the first time, and he gave me um, the... Uh, he gave me a, 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 a play to do a scene from uh, what is Arthur Miller's uh, uh, View from the Bridge. View from the Bridge. Yeah, I was uh, playing the lawyer, uh, Alferi. Alferi. And I started reading the scene. When that scene, uh, scene came, for the first time in my life, this other character suddenly rose up from the book and started talking to me. That was a very strange feeling. And uh, I remember I had a conversation with my brother uh, who died with AIDS. Um, but uh, he was refusing to marry my niece, his daughter, outside the caste. And he calling me and giving me all kinds of excuses and fight and all that. And I was trying to chastise him and trying to make some sense to him because I don't believe in the caste. And then uh, that other character, Alfari, was listening and advising, sounded like it's my brother rising up and talking to me. And, uh, and I took the scene into the class. I cried. Uh, I mean, um, uh, Ashin can... said this is the best thing I have seen from you that day. Maybe you should be teaching a class now. So. I, I don't know. I, I think I have a lot more to learn. Well, we all do. It's a never-ending process. But what you did of uh, using part of your personal experience uh, to bring it to the uh, character is kind of what we try to teach people to do. So obviously you have a, a feel for it and an understanding of uh, what the, what it takes to really do something well, to, to use yourself in that way. It, it was spontaneous. I mean, when one time I, I worked with Alan Arkin's workshop, uh, not to boast myself, but um, he gave all these exercises we have to bring in something on Saturday. So I picked up a scene like uh, uh, Clinton, President Clinton, uh, inviting Monica Lewinsky uh, for uh, Hillary's birthday, and there is Jesse Jackson, and all the other people who are there, 
and uh, we did the scene. Uh, it 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 uh, after the scene, he, he thought this is not going to work. But after we did it, it worked because I believed in it. Uh, now, what part did you play? Uh, I played uh, uh, Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> what else? <laughs> uh, but he told me Rao used to get a big leap. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what I what, what what it meant. But afterwards, I realized when I started this show, and also I started doing some uh, thing like that with the untouchable group in this town for um, but their birthdays. We used, I used to do some like bring uh, the creator of the caste system mm -hmm. and put him like uh, like Obama mediating between Gandhi and the leader of the untouchables and they were fighting with each other. And I transported Obama to the 1930s mm -hmm. uh, and we did the scene. It was fun. Everyone laughed. Uh, so I, now then I understood, oh, okay, this is what he meant. Uh, and there's a connection there between the situation, actually, in both in both uh, It was decades. fun. It, so I started yeah. doing this kind of uh, uh, stuff, and I, I think it comes out much uh, uh, interesting. I don't give script to the actors. I just tell them you this is the situation. Tell them who you are. And then it someti sometimes it works naturally. Well, good. Well, listen, I'm going to say it's been great talking to you. I don't know. Uh, what I think I would like to do is to turn this back over to you, because you're the expert at this, uh, and tell you what a delightful interviewee you are. Interviewee, yes, I'm the interviewer now. Well, you know, it's a matter of uh, semantics, but, uh, you know, I think uh, you interviewed me better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for talking to me and uh, talking to all of us and to giving us an insight into you and why you're here and your dedications and your beliefs and your strong beliefs and the fact that you have succeeded at uh, things that you've aspired to do. You've done things and you've put yourself on the line. And I think that's, uh, in even in the theater or in acting, you have to put yourself on the line as well. So you've done it, and thank you for allowing me to interview you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, now taking back my child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll go back. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> no. You know, but uh, it seems you have a more interesting life uh, growing up in Harlem. Or, uh, I, I didn't really touch that aspect until you mentioned about it in the last show. Uh, yeah. Were you brought up in Harlem as a child? Or? Yes, I was born in Harlem. Ah. And I went, uh, we lived in Harlem until I guess I was in public school. I went to kindergarten and all of that in Harlem. Then we moved upscale to the Bronx. Oh, I see. <laughs> and then finally we ended up in Queens. But the theater has always been around, even though I didn't consciously do it. I was in all the plays in Sunday school, you know, in my church. We would do plays for Easter and Christmas. I always played the older characters. I never, I always played the fathers for some reason. But did your parents uh, encourage you or discourage you? Yes, they you? did. Oh. My parents were wonderful. Maybe I should have you. <laughs> 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 they always told me, and I, don't, I guess I kind of believed it, that I didn't know what I wanted to do. I really didn't have a direction, but they always hit, hit me over the head almost to tell me that I could do anything I wanted to do, regardless of whatever, you know, the situation and the politics and the racism. So if you want to do something, you're capable of doing it. So they pounded it in my head. So I believed it. I don't know if they were kidding or not. So when... Um, I went to school. I went uh, to high school. I went to um, I went to Brooklyn College, but I, I kind of felt lost. I kind of was lost. Then I started working for the city, which I liked a lot because I had a job. But I still didn't. I just there was just something else. And then finally, I when I found the theater, it found me more or less. Um, I kind of found something. I knew I would do it the rest of my life, even though I didn't think that I, it would be what I did. It wouldn't be who, what I would become. But I'm very happy. I enjoy it. Um, 
I guess teaching, the best thing about teaching is to see your students, you know, to go and see your students on the stage or to turn on the television and say, oh, you know, I, uh, I know that person, I remember that young person. Or even to, I ended up once, my big thrill was I did a voiceover commercial. It wasn't a big thing, but it was with one of my students. We both did it together oh. professionally, and uh, I just was thrilled by it. Uh, so I guess um, the best thing I can do is just to see uh, someone that you've helped. I think they would have helped, would have been uh, doing what they did without my help. But um, it's just good, and uh, I guess that's the fulfillment of teaching at all, is to see people do great things. Suppose if I give you another hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to give you more. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. What would you do? Oh, I guess I would do what I'm doing now. I would do what I'm doing now. I think I'll probably do that until I just can't do it. Uh, because it's great to hear someone say, well, you helped them, whether you did or not. What is it that drives you towards this uh, acting? Yeah, I think as a, as a child, I, we always go back, you did too, to our childhood. Uh, my father worked in a printing place where they printed comic books. And it always uh, intrigued me. I was the comic book king would bring home the comic of being another person, you know, like uh, Superman really was Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne is really Batman. And I always felt that there were these other people that I could be. You know, I was Arthur, but I could be, you know, and you can do things, you know, on, on you know, you can be mean and you can be spiteful, you can be evil uh, when you're acting and then you can once the curtain comes down, a teacher of mine told me that once, once the curtain comes down, all bets are off. So I always felt I would be these other characters, not Superman, but someone other than myself, that I could have an experience that I would not ordinarily have. You know, I could uh, have a good experience or a bad experience. You can, you know, if you're acting, you can kill someone. And even though you don't do that in life, we've all kind of felt like it sometime. So I, th I think it allows me to be these other people, you know, this secret identity uh, that it's me, but then it's not me, it's someone else. Would you like to be a playwright? Both of my children write. Oh. I don't write anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do it for you. They do it for me. I enjoy them, and they're doing well at, you know, at what they do, so I leave that to them. You have a big family. I have two children. Um, I have a son who, um, I'll just brag quickly, who <laughs> got his play, uh, one of his plays published by Samuel French two years ago. And uh, my daughter writes for television. What's the play he... He wrote a play called, and he's going to kill me if I can't think of the title of it. Uh, it it'll come to me. Okay. Uh, uh, but, uh, well, what's your daughter writes for? She writes, right now she's writing for a show called Are We There Yet? Oh, okay. And that's on now, and she's writing for that. Circuit Breakers is the name of his <laughs> prize-winning play. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, so, so they do that, and uh, I enjoy them doing that. You know, I looked at my daughter's show that she wrote was on last night on television. So uh, she lives in Los Angeles. She's oh yeah, all those uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but he lives here, so. Um, no, I have. Uh, I'm a widower. Uh -huh. So, but they both they're both doing well. And Do you live in Harlem? Or? No, I live in Queens. Oh, okay. so I still live in Queens. And, uh, but I'm I'm here. I'm in the city all the time. I mean, yeah, I'm I see you around. Yeah, most I'm of always the time. in the city. So it was a place that my mother and parents had moved out there, and so I'm still there. I'll probably be there forever. And uh, well, suppose if uh, Bollywood producer asks you. Would I'm you off like to, to Bollywood. <laughs> 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 I'll be on the train, plane, bus, or whatever. Um, well, tell, you know, when you speak of Bollywood, is it really just trying to do what Hollywood does? Well, Bollywood means actually, there, see, we have 26 odd states, 28 states. See, each state has a separate language. And uh, in, in Maharashtra, Bombay is the Hindi. So every state has their own uh, movies. Oh. 
So, and predominantly Hindi is the major language. It's a second language. So, uh, so it became kind of uh, synonymous with uh, Hollywood. So they changed the name to like imitating the name Hollywood. They right. made it Bombay. It's Bollywood. Ah, okay. And it's in my mother tongue, Telugu. Now the movies that come from our state, uh, they call it now Tollywood. So everyone <laughs> having a wood. Wood in it. So good. scene will have a Manhattan wood, wood and Queens wood. wood. La. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, as long do you have lots of actors there? Are actors treated? there as they are here you know are they stars and well there are stars but it's more like a family affairs it's a little more closely confined mm -hmm. rather than open like here it's, it's a little more diverse it's much easier for me to get an opportunity here than in the bollywood really yeah uh, people would think otherwise but uh, but it is a very closed uh, family affair uh, it's 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 much harder to break in. Is that right? Well, there's a man, and I, I think I'm going to mispronounce the name, but I think his last name is Morgandini. You know, it's, it's something. Like, but he's come here, and he said that to me. Yeah, most of these people uh, that that has uh, never able to break into Bollywood come here. Now they're saying, "Oh, I'm from Bollywood." <laughs> they're not from Bollywood. <laughs> <laughs> if they're from Bollywood, they wouldn't be here. Yeah. Well, they would come in a different level, level. Uh, but but not like these. But people. we're getting more pictures. I think it's because of the Slumdog Millionaire. Yeah. See, what happened is it like uh, waves. We had a first wave in the uh, 50s and 60, early 60s, mm -hmm. when this British director found this uh, Indian kid in Rajasthan, and brought him over, and he played all these Apu characters. Uh, Who was that? Uh, it used to be all this Apu, Jungle Boy. Oh, all Sabu, they Sabu, Sabu. Sabu. Yeah. And then uh, we have another wave now, uh, the Slumdog Millionaire. Yeah. Uh, so now everyone, everyone from England, all the kids are coming over here. So it seems like it's the British that opened the doors for the Hollywood for Indians. Well, you have watched an interesting episode. So until next time, we take leave. Thank you and come back and see us on the next episode. Ooh, ooh, ooh.